Thanks, Scott. Hello, everyone. My name is Dwayne Gatesel, and I'm moderating this panel. And the subject is whether the FTC's ban on non-competes um, will hold. And the answer is no. So, <laughs> so I, okay. I, I think we're done. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Now, as you, as you may know, uh, a district judge in the Northern District of Texas a week ago ruled that the non-compete ban was invalid and so forth. And so what we're going to talk about now is, you know, should that be, what are the alternatives, kind of the background to, to the act, what they were trying to accomplish, and where we go from here. So before we get into that, I'm going to ask each panelist to briefly introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Courtney Lytle. I am a partner at Culhane Meadows. I practice mostly in IP, but also in general corporate. I've been writing non-competes for longer than I want to admit, so I have a bit to talk about. Um, I also am an adjunct professor. I'm an adjunct professor at Emory University School of Law. I've been doing that for more years than I'm actually willing to admit in public. <laughs> so. My inner professor, I think, is going to jump out and give us a little overview at the beginning, and then we'll talk policy with everyone. Uh, my name's Jose. I'm at uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation based out of New York, EFF's based out of San Francisco. I was born here in Atlanta, so I have a lot of pride for, uh, for home. And uh, I uh, uh, work with our activism team, which means that I'm not a tech person nor a lawyer. Um, EFF is made up of all three. Uh, I also worked uh, to some degree in DC at one point on uh, supporting regulatory rules, uh, the CFPB and FTC, uh, a number of years ago. My name is TJ Myhill. I'm an attorney at Stites and Harbison uh, in our Atlanta office. I do business and intellectual property litigation. Uh, so, uh, unlike Courtney, I have the litigation side. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's. He's uh, nice anyway. Don't <laughs> hold it against him. I'm nice. I'll charge you for it, but I'm nice. <laughs> and I should just add uh, my name again, Dwayne Gatesel. I'm from Austin, Texas. And so please don't hold it against me with respect to the Northern District of Texas <laughs> judge's ruling. Thank you. <laughs> so the first question, let's start with something basic. Everyone here probably knows, but let's talk about what is a non-compete agreement? Who wants to handle it? Courtney? Sure. Okay. Um, Non-compete agreements are a contract, and that means it's not a law that applies to everyone. It's a contract you enter into with a different with another party, and only those two parties are bound by it. The FTC rule is separate. That's a rule that would apply to everyone in the country. The contract that you sign when you get a job that says you have a separate, um, usually non-disclosure, that says I won't tell any secrets, I won't take the client list with me, I won't steal the secret sauce and sell it to others then the non-compete is usually in conjunction with that that says, I won't go. And there, here it depends on the situation. A non-compete has generally been covered by state law. That's why we're going to talk about the FTC weighing in on this as a huge step for the federal government to announce, and not just the government, but a regulatory agency to decide, oh, we're going to make a nationwide rule. The states have been managing these for you know as long as we've had states and contracts. So the general rule varies slightly from state to state. Some are more restrictive than others. The general rule is in an employment context, the non-compete has to be reasonable. And every state comes up with different ways to say what reasonable means. It means what you think it means. This is not one of those times that we took a perfectly normal word and tortured it. Um, it just means reasonable. So if I am hiring you to work at my Jiffy Lube, I cannot say that you can never work in another mechanic or garage or anywhere else ever until you die. So can I interrupt? Is the Hollywood cliche of you'll never work in this town again? Is that wrong? Hollywood is wrong, just as a rule. <laughs> um, <laughs> but any any non-compete with an employee is going to have to be it's going to have to be reasonable overall and I'm trying to avoid the 18 subsets of that because y'all don't care. But the three main things it has to be reasonable on is overall scope. So, and the public policy is that we don't let anyone keep you from exercising your profession, from getting a job. We don't let that happen. So it has to be reasonably narrow in scope. It has to be reasonably narrow in time. So never work again. I assume they're sending the hitman after you. But you have to have a time limit to it. And even though it's starting to be somewhat obsolete, you still have to have a geographic scope to it. So if my my husband, for instance, just left a horribly abusive employer, but they had said that he couldn't open a practice within five miles of where his current clinic was. Well, that's reasonable. But the main thing that you're trying to defend there is you can't steal our patients and take them off to be your patients. 
if they track you down and follow you, that's okay. But you can't solicit them to go and you cannot open an office within a certain number of miles of where you're currently working. Now, obviously, in a lot of jobs, that geographic thing is almost obsolete at this point or is obsolete. But in a lot of professions, it still matters. So those three elements have to be reasonable to non-compete. Now, a couple of times I've said non-compete in an employment context. The other way that non-competes come into effect are not touched by any of what we're talking about in here, which is in a sale of business context. Sale of business context basically means I've run, I've started this business, I've been running it, woohoo, I'm getting bought out, I'm taking my millions, I'm retiring, life is good, but I can't open a competing shop across the street. Any of y'all um, from Philly, <laughs> you know, the two competing, um, the cheesesteak stands right across the street, Gino's and Pat's. Down here, we had Gus's and Son's, where his son went and opened a competing fried chicken shop across the street. If there had been a sale of business rather than just people hating each other, including the dad and the son, um, then they would have been able to have an enforceable covenant saying, no, you can never open a business that close to us, or you can't for 30 years. 30 would be unreasonable for an employee for a sale of business. I'm already paying you a lot of money. I'm not just giving you the joy and right to work in my business. You know, I'm paying you a bunch of money for your business. So on with you. So the sale of business context does not apply here. This is only in an employment context. That's my down and dirty. All right. Thank uh, you. And I, I do you want to get into yeah, so, so I would, uh, I would, you know, I think that we have some different perspectives on the panel, which is really fun and juicy. And I'm also not a lawyer, so I'm probably going to lose them. Um, not because I'm wrong, but because, you know, expertise. Also, be because I'm. <laughs> yeah. And we'll um, guard you. So. <laughs> but uh, so for my experience with non-competes, non-compete uh, agreements are something that uh, something like 18 or 19 percent, according to the FTC in, in their original uh, notice of proposed rulemaking, um, uh, they suggested about 18 percent of workers in the formal economy in the United States, that's 30 million workers, have to sign uh, mm -hmm. not, uh, non compete agreements with their employers. And that 30 to 40% of the workers who do sign them sign them after they've already accepted the position. So, and then, you know, take this a little bit further. Uh, the Communications Workers of America did a poll of workers um, who had signed non competes. And in the poll that they signed, they said that 10%, 10 of the workers who responded um, said that they did not feel that they would have. Uh, uh, that they did not feel that they would have lost the job or they would not have been able to keep the position had they refused to sign. So that's 90% of workers in that poll who signed these non-competes felt that they would not be able to get the job. Um, beyond, beyond that, in, this, in, the, in the context, this, as far as I know of uh, Georgia um, and a number of states nearby, uh, the time frame you know, I've, I've seen usually time frames range from six months to two years, but mm -hmm. uh, in Georgia, I have almost exclusively seen two year non compete agreements. Um, and it tends to be, uh, they're, they're t they tend to be a very big variety of how the distance is. So they're, they're definitely five mile, 10 mile radius. Uh, I've definitely also seen in Pittsburgh, uh, for example, the, the University of um, Pittsburgh physicians, uh, they have one that is the entire Allegheny County of Pittsburgh and 10 miles uh, uh, radius from any uh, any facilities that you may work at in all of the state of Pennsylvania. Other people feel there there there's a, a tire, you were mentioning Jiffy Lube, there's a tire uh, uh, repair shop in Savannah, Georgia that had a 50 mile radius and that's for drivers. That's for, uh, that's for, for uh, low skilled repair people. So a driver or low skilled repair person is not supposed to work in a similar kind of position um, in a similar kind of uh, uh, job for 50 mile radius around Savannah. That means uprooting your family if you lose that job, even if you're fired, right? Because it's not just if you quit, it's if you're fired. And these are not people who are leaving with trade secrets, right? These are not people who are, who are also necessarily opening their own um, shop. However, a lot of the people who were very concerned about this in Georgia, as far as uh, you know, my little bit of research was people in the uh, in the medical field. It was a lot of physicians, and so it does also uh, kind of shut down their ability to open up their own shops. Um, whether it's competing, whether it's to take um, clients or to just continue their work because they feel that the salaries have gone down in their sector or they've been otherwise adversely affected by something that's happened with their employer, with the organization that they work for. 
So that's just a, a little yeah. of the kind of on the ground experience. Uh, and I want to just, that's one of the reasons that the rules in Georgia and in other states, they're similar, they all vary some, but Georgia's are fairly average to my knowledge. They, um, that's why we say reasonable, because what's reasonable for a Jiffy Lube guy is going to be different than for an attorney or for a physician or for a manager or for a CEO or something like that. And that makes sense. So we don't have a fixed two miles is reasonable or two years is reasonable or anything like that. It's what is reasonable in the individual context. Part of the problem with that is that a Jiffy Lube employee probably cannot afford to hire a lawyer to challenge it. And that's a huge problem across the board in our justice system. And it applies here as well. But the I would be willing to bet that if he hired a fine litigator like TJ, that you could get 50 miles for a Jiffy Lube employee thrown out. Well, first of all, the Georgia statute doesn't even apply to Jiffy Lube employees. Anymore. We changed it a few years ago. So it did used to, you, you used to be able to get a rule for anyone in Georgia. You had, you had a non-compete that would apply to everyone. Um, but now we've changed the non-compete statute, right. not necessarily for the better, because instead of being cut or dry, good or bad, if you used, you used to be able to come to me and, and 10 years ago, I could look at your non-compete and say, this will fail or this will be enforced. I can tell you whether you can go to another job or not. You can take it with certainty whether you're going to get sued or not. The the new statute allows the judges to revise things to be more reasonable right. so if if the if 50 miles is unreasonable the judge can say let's make it 25. if five years is unreasonable the judge can say make it two but along with that came some language in the statute that some other states not a lot of other states but some other states also have that limits the types of employees to whom a non-compete can apply that non-compete, the reason states are allowed these, the reason that, that even states that are very, very anti-non-compete still have some provisions for them is there are good business reasons to have them in place. There are legitimate business interests that can be protected. But those business interests tend to be things like poaching clients or taking trade secrets or doing something that would be harmful to the business improperly. And so the this Georgia statute now only applies to the types of people who would have access to those to, to those clients or customers or information and or or have some managerial control or are key executive employees. It's not super clear whether it applies to everybody or not. You you really do need to kind of feel out what exactly you do at your job and what exactly your non-compete is trying to protect against. But it is more restrictive so that we can't, we're trying to not get the Jiffy Lube guy yeah. to be completely out of work. One other note, um, a couple other notes, you know, in terms of uh, state law and then enforcement. So in California, they're banned. It's one of the states that, that relatively restricts them much more than Georgia and then, than a lot of other states. And uh, according, again, to the FTC um, and the FTC's research and the research that it, that it trusted, uh, the percentage of, of workers in a formal economy in California who sign non-competed uh, clauses was about the same. Uh, the CWA, SCIU, there were, the CWA union, SCIU a union, um, I used to be a shop steward in SCIU, I'm currently in IFPTE. Uh, they, uh, they did a, you know, a little bit more research on this and, and what they found was they, they think over about 53% of the workers who uh, sign non-compete agreements make $14 or less, right? These are low-wage hourly workers. And so they're not going to be able to get TJ's help right. in, in that case. And so what happens in the state of California is that workers sign these illegal agreements according to state law and can't get out of them, can't, unless they have a union, unless they have union representation, or for example, there might be like a nonprofit, you know, public interest labor law firm. There are very few of those in the country. Um, that uh, that can help them out, they're going to be stuck. So when, what the enforcement then looks like is the enforcement isn't necessarily through the courts because it is unenforceable in the courts. It is uh, sometimes an agreement between one employer and the next and, and your next employer. Uh, they send a letter that says we're going to fight this. This uh, employee signed a non-disclosure, and then you lose your job. They may not be able to fight it in the court where they then can get. Uh, some non-disclosure agreements require a, a year's worth of wages or salary, some you know astronomical amount of money 
um, that the employee is supposed to pay to the former employer, or in some cases, the new employer is supposed to pay to the former employer. And so they're not going to be able to get that kind of re remuneration, but the workers are still going to lose their jobs. Right. right. And in the end, the, the effect is still the same in a lot of states, even where there are highly restrictive laws against uh, non compete breaches. Well, let's talk a little bit about that, because I think that raises the point of what the FTC was trying to do, because you do have this patchwork quilt of laws, depending mm -hmm. on the state that you're in. Uh, so someone explain what was the FTC trying to do from kind of a high level policy? Courtney, are you or TJ care to take that? Or I'm happy to if y'all want to jump in. I don't want to steal the mic the whole time. You can take the mic as much as you want. I'm going to disagree with you and then come back. <laughs> say, That's fair. You know I'll interrupt you. So it's Excellent. <laughs> we understand each other. Um, TJ and I may have done a few panels together before. I'm not sure if that shows. Um, what the FTC was doing on its initial impetus was doing what the Biden administration told it to do. Biden administration said, okay, FTC, we don't like these. Go fix that. Okay, um, and so the FTC said, we're thinking about making a rule, which they're required to do. They accepted comments. They did what they always do, which is say, oh, thank you for your interest in national defense and went and did what they wanted to. Um, although I think the majority of the comments they got supported the rule that they made. Unfortunately for them, in my opinion, but on this one, I'm solid, <laughs> um, the FTC overreached their authority. There are strict requirements of what an agency can do and what they cannot do in terms of substantive rulemaking. And the FTC honestly did not have the authority to make that broad a rule. That it's a substantive question is one of the buzz terms in agency and um, administrative law. And there's no way to say with 90% of employees feeling stuck in their, in their non-competes and a huge number of people um, having them. How many of y'all are currently subject to a non-compete? Oof. There's a lot of folks who are restricted in what they can do and looking for their next job. And it's it is and it is a problem for an employee. Um, I mentioned my husband has just changed jobs. He had a significant non-compete, some of which he was not even close to, and some of which was a problem. And fortunately he knew a lawyer. Um <laughs> and we negotiated him out of it. But not everybody has a lawyer that they can not not even call but nudge and say, Can you fix this? Um, so the ability to get out of those agreements, even when they're not appropriate, is definitely a real issue, but it's a substantive one. This, this impacts a huge amount of the nation and of the economy. So that's one of the things that says if it's substantive like that, the FTC or any agency cannot make a substantive rule, this is a substantive rule, without express authority from Congress. Because Congress could enter this field, and it's interstate commerce. That's another lecture. Mm -hmm. um, but Congress could pass a law. Congress is not allowed to say, hey, you know what would be better than us doing it? Let's pick an agency where no one is elected and no one is in any way required to respond to people and voters, and let's put them in charge of making the laws. And that's, in effect, what the FTC did here. They said, we're going to make a law. And we're going to impose it on 50 states blanket wide and say, no, you can't have these anymore. Now, these agreements, for better or for worse, have been around since there have been employees. It goes back to medieval guilds and such in one form or another. So these aren't some new thing. They've been around forever. Whether they've been good or bad, there's a huge argument that we can go through on a policy level. But the FTC decided to make this substantive rule. Obviously, they thought they had the authority to do so. or this is purely me conjecturing. I do not have any inside sources. I think they knew they didn't have the authority, but figured they'd do it anyway, in part because their boss said to, and in part because they think it's important to do it. And lots of people really don't give a damn what the law is if they think right is on their side. They forget that there's the other 50% of the population who disagrees with them and may be an empower someday in the future. And you don't want the other side to have that much authority either. And that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at how we analyze what an agency, which is not answerable to anyone, frankly, can do without congressional approval. And so the FTC just took the bit in their teeth and ran and passed this law. The district judge um, that Duane mentioned in Texas recently ruled that, no, you didn't have the authority to do this. She did not rule non-competes are good and I hate workers and I want them all to starve. 
she ruled the FTC did not have the authority to take this step. One reason she was able to do that, and I don't think any of y'all want to talk about Chevron, but I feel well, obligated to, to mention it. We have to. Um, we kind of have to. We kind of have to. But Chevron was an opinion that was um, binding on everyone for, God, I don't even know how many years, that said that you have to give substantial um, deference to anything an agency does. The Supreme Court recently said, that's garbage. No, you don't. You have to listen to them, but you don't have to assume they're always right. And with that ruling, all agency actions, not just the FTC, but all agency actions where they say, no, 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 we know best. You silly elected officials, go away. You silly constituents, we don't care what you say. We know what's best for you. And and so they, um, so she Chevron said, why, well, yes, you have to tell them that they know best. You have to listen to anything they say. That's no longer the case. The new rule is okay, use your own mind. You don't have to give substantial deference. And without that substantial deference requirement, you're going to see a lot more agency actions overthrown. I think this is the first, if not one of, if not the first major, it's very early first in the curve. So the first major case that has been brought since Chevron was thrown out. And it's honestly going to be the first of many where judges now have the ability to overturn rules where the agency clearly did not have legal authority which and is why i think we're dealing with. which is why i think that this is the one that's probably going to get appealed too i don't know that i i i don't know that i disagree with courtney that it's completely uh un, untenable it, it, it is it is a substantive rule that affects all 50 states but it it is something that i think that the ftc might continue to pursue to see if they can get someone at a oh, different yeah. level to agree with them because the thing Always is the they had a circuit split. Two courts said no, I'm not going to, or two courts said yes, I am going to enjoin this, although only against the actual plaintiffs in that suit. Um, and one court in Pennsylvania said no, I'm not going to enjoin this. This is fine. So the there's a there's a potential for a, a very different ruling at a different court. Yeah. And I think they pursue that. I think they also try to pursue trying to take more nuanced rulemaking and get something that will fly past the the court analysis well, that would be appropriate but, yeah so they i think follow that, the rules i think that that's the the, the directions so the when we when we ask you know does this affect you and we start by saying no we mean no it won't affect you on september 4th like it was originally going to now it will probably continue to affect you if not by ftc action itself or court action itself by other states responding to this issue Mm -hmm. the, this again, there are there there are plenty of states that are not very pro non compete. They 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 are very restrictive in what they do, if not outright try to ban them. But it is it is definitely something that I think will will have further legislative action, whether it be at the yeah. state legislative level or the federal legislative level. Absolutely, I agree. And if y'all are interested in this issue. This is going to be something that now the states are going to be looking at again because it's been in the headlines. So each of your representatives are getting phone calls. And when they get phone calls, sometimes they do stuff. Mm -hmm. So this would be a great time if you have a strong opinion about this. But don't bother calling Washington. Yeah, you know, <laughs> seriously. And that's why a lot of things left to the states are better because your local representative will talk to you. And will now whether you can get something passed in your state or not, you know, welcome to politics. But this would be a time if you want to be an activist on this issue, if you want to talk to your local representatives on this issue, it's going to be moving. I would guess most states are going to address it very soon for that very reason. Right. They said, well, we were kind of saying, oh, good, someone else is doing it. And, you know, we're all human. Oh, you mean someone else is going to handle that? Oh, good. Um, so they're so going to step up. One thing I think we should add to this, too, is we're, we're talking about what the FTC rule tried to do. I think it's important to talk about what it expressly didn't try to do this applied strictly to non-competes between employees it did not affect sale of business like courtney said earlier but it also didn't affect non-solicitation agreements and also didn't affect your nda or in fact mm -hmm. the ftc expressly called that out as a way that the business could use these other existing mechanisms to protect without preventing Correct. you from going across the street and getting a job but you still wouldn't be able to solicit all your employees or, or, or your customers away when you left. That wouldn't have been affected by this this ban. 
you you would still be bound by your confidentiality agreements. You wouldn't be able to tell anybody's trade secrets. I would not have been affected by this ban. This ban only applied to uh, contracts that made it restrictive on where you could work for how long or starting a new business in some cases. Yes. Yeah. Um, the one, you know, so to backtrack a little bit, um, and I'm not going to get into the legal debate that I really wish I could, because, but I don't have the expertise to do so on, oh, on some of these questions. Please. But, but in Please. terms of what the FTC thought it was doing, or at least what they claimed their reasoning was, was they, they said that the FTC Act on Section 5 uh, ban, uh, uh, you know, restricts unfair methods of competition. And so they already were engaging, and I'm sure we'll talk about enforcement and other things like that, but they were already engaging in case-by-case -case enforcement actions. And the NLRB was doing the same around their, their reading of how the uh, uh, non-competes actually are in violation of uh, the National Labor Relations Act. So in theory, each of these agencies is uh, allowed to enforce things that are on, in the original laws that were passed, and that's not something that would be contested by the Supreme Court last year, the, the, uh, Chevron the, the Chevron decision. Was it early this year or last year? It was last doesn't year. make any sense to me. Everything since 2020 is. It was recent, oh, but I've found myself talking about recent amendments that were in the 90s. So, so that would that would in theory give them maybe some grounds for appeal. That would or that would be the grounds for which they would try to appeal that they're that they were trying to uh, regulate something that they're already. Uh, enforce doing enforcement actions on based on the original FTC Act, and that is uh, a debate that I don't necessarily, you know, want personally. I can't delve into, and I'm not going to. Um, but I do think that they are going to continue to do these enforcement actions, mm -hmm. as is the NLRB, and it would be useful for employees and employers um, to have a consistent enforcement. And I also think that you know we should be allowed to live anywhere in this great country that we want and uh, not to have to make choices based upon either non-competes that we've signed or based upon uh, a lack of regulation in some states. Um, you know, in, in some states, they may protect workers on, in, in, uh, with regard to certain things and other places they don't. I, don't. I think that it would be better if it was less of a patchwork person. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to your point about enforcement, part of that is absolutely correct. The FTC does have the authority to enforce existing federal laws. That's one of their jobs. And they have generally not but at, right at the beginning of the year they brought i think their first ever enforcement action against a non-compete and the day before it was finalized they announced oh and by the way because this is such a huge problem that we just talked about for the first time a month ago we're going to make a rule <laughs> yeah a little self-serving but there's a distinction between their ability to make a new rule that applies to everyone and their ability to say hey wait this circumstance is not okay. This Jiffy Lube in Savannah, or it wasn't Jiffy Lube, tire company in Savannah that has a 50 mile non-compete for an employee, that's garbage. You can't do that. And they can take an enforcement action against that employer and say, this agreement is not okay. Huge difference between that agreement's abusive. No, you can't do it. That is unfair competition or one of the other buzz phrases they can pull out of other federal statutes huge difference between that and we are saying no one can ever write a contract at all as opposed to this contract is abusive you can't ever write a contract that's a huge huge difference and the ftc does have the authority to enforce unfair competition laws they do not have the authority to write new ones which is what they just did that just got overturned so let's take the let's assume the ftc does try to appeal is there any grounds in which they can do so to try to scale it back to say for example, no, it's only going to be enforceable if it adheres to these one, two, three standards and they minimize that, or is it just from the ground level that you don't think they have the capacity or ability to do it? Feel free to jump in, anyone. I think in general, with respect to the rulemaking, something this that broad or even slightly more tailored, but still with that substantial impact to businesses and employees across the country, they would need authority from Congress to do it. <laughs> they can't say oh well we'll only enforce it on tuesdays or something like right. that and have the judge say on appeal of this case say oh well okay that's fine then no no they might want to try to start a new rule they have to go back to square right. one and make the announcement and go through the hoops they might try that again sure i think what tj was suggesting is much more likely almost guaranteed is that they're going to appeal this opinion this is a district court i mean for pity's sake until it gets to the circuit court we don't usually even pay attention 
And so, but she made this nationally binding from a district court, which is somewhat unusual, less so than it used to be. But so she, I think that that opinion initially is going to be appealed. TJ was saying that, and I totally agree. And I think that any other case that is brought up under this is um, going to be appealed as well. I assume this will end up in the Supreme Court. I yeah, don't... I can tell you, since it's going to go from the Northern District of Texas to the Fifth Circuit, I know exactly what that opinion is going to be. <laughs> it's going to... Next. Well, they'll be so... correct in that case. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Pennsylvania is on the opposite yeah, track. Exactly. All we need is something out of the Ninth Circuit, which will, I guarantee, go against um, Texas. So you're going to have a split of the circuits. Once you have a split of the circuits, you have an you have an authority to get to the Supreme Court. And that's probably where it needs to be. The Supreme Court needs to say no. When we said Chevron doesn't count and you have to have authority from Congress, we meant it. And that would be my guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the the appeal the appeal has to be on this. Uh, on, on this rule, that's the yeah, they that's the only appeal process. They, they, they could only say this, do. not we'll change it a little bit. If you want to change it a little bit, you start again. But I I also think that there's a fair chance that maybe you see both both trains move at the same time. Yeah, we're going to file an appeal, but we're also going to start a different rule. Yeah, the 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 issue with putting it back in the hands of the FTC or the NRB to for, to do case by case enforcement is. That's not really a different process than you bringing it to me and me hashing it out with your employer's lawyer. It's it's still an enforcement question and how is it going to be enforced and how is it going to be read and is someone going to find this reasonable? And the, the question isn't, do you think it's reasonable or do I think it's reasonable? We have to wait for the man or woman in the black robe to tell us that it is reasonable or the or the 12 people sitting to his right to say that it is reasonable. So that's the that's the issue. You're still going to deal with eleven. The they haven't. They haven't expanded the court. Oh, good yet. point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I meant the jury. He meant the, the jury. Yeah, <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> that's what I heard. <laughs> but but the the um you know the 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 the, the challenge of enforcement is it's slow, mm -hmm. it's costly, and it's uncertain because no one's going to be able to tell you how it will come out until it comes out. Right. Um. That again, I made the point earlier that that it used to be. There were some clear things. If you didn't have these clear things in Georgia, it was going to fail. Yeah, I could tell you for sure it was going to fail. I couldn't tell you for sure that the rest of it would be upheld because even though it had the required geographical scope or or time scope, was that going to be decided to be enforceable? We still have to go to court and figure that out. So, but if they had all those things, it probably was something we would try to negotiate or settle because. There was a risk, whereas if we knew for sure we were going to get it shot down, there's less risk in taking that to court. So it, the the question of enforcement is always a challenge because you just have no idea how it's going to go. We don't have a crystal ball. Yeah, and, and I'll say every uh, the federal agencies are going to all be watching this very oh, yeah. closely. Yeah, and they've had their marching orders. The Biden administration wants this to be moved forward, and so they're doing what their boss said. You know, we all kind of do that. So let's talk about since the ban is not going to take effect in five days, yeah. employers do not have to notify their employees of you've signed this document that's now illegal. Um, so let's talk about the alternatives. You know, what remedies are there for workers? What remedies are there for employers and where people go from there from a practical standpoint, assuming that the ban holds? Who wants to start with that? I'll jump in on that one. So it, it's what I mentioned before. It's what the FTC told you to do. Um, the first one is a non-solicitation. If you have a non-compete, mm -hmm. you almost certainly have a non-solicitation agreement in your contract too. Those those just go hand in hand, peanut butter and jelly, because people want to make sure that you don't go to the competitor, but you also can't take my clients no matter where you go, or my customers, or my whoever. So the 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 idea of a non-solicitation agreement is. It provides the same thing. You have to have for a limited time and in a limited sphere, although geographically it is usually not as required in a, in a non solicitation. You can't reach out and solicit business from the people you did business with at my company. You can't poach all my customers and take them to the new guy or your new business or whatever you're going to. So the non solicitation agreement prevents the the concern the that, that businesses push as their legitimate interest that they're trying to protect with non-competes is I don't want you taking my 
information and I don't want you taking my clients. So the non-solicitation prevents you taking clients while not stopping you from working anywhere. You can go to work wherever you want. You just can't pick up the phone and call the 30 people you worked with at my shop and bring them over to your new place. So that's, that's item number one. And then the information, we protect the information with our current trade secrets and NDA agreements, confidentiality agreements. If you have a legitimate trade secret, not a lot of people do, then there are very restrictive laws on what you can and can't do about that. But we can all sign a contract that says, this is important information to my business and you agree that you're not gonna use it outside of working for my business and supporting my business and my, my customers. And again, if you have, if you have a non-compete, if you have a non-solicit, you almost certainly have an NDA of some sort. <laughs> if you don't have a non-complete or a non-solicit, but you work for somebody, you probably still have an NDA of some sort. Is that enforceable? How broad is that? How there's a lot of questions about whether they're good, bad, or otherwise, but that's the solution. I'm not going to solicit non-solicitation agreement. I'm not going to reveal your information, confidentiality agreement. That theoretically solves the issues that businesses are trying to protect without restricting your ability to earn a living. I'll, I'll just give an example real quick of one of those, you know, in, in um, I don't know if you've ever been to a public hospital or you've ever been to a university hospital and had a uh, physician ask you if you would come to, to meet them on the side. They have a private practice on the side and then they uh, are like, so actually I'll do my appointment with you at my private practice. That would be that would be a, a pretty clear example of that. Um, Unethical as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, but they do it constantly. And it is, it is actually having a pretty big effect on public health care, certainly in the North, and because a lot of public hospitals are losing, uh, they lose some of their, their patients um, to this kind of practice. It's a very, very you know common issue. And those are the patients that are actually able to pay the bills. Um, yeah. So uh, they never solicit the ones that are broke. Right. Nice. <laughs> so uh, you know, in terms of um, in terms of alternative uh, options, I think one of the others. So the, the FTC will see if they continue to do enforcements based on their reading of Section Five and what could be an unfair method of competition. Um, the other big one is the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, uh, views non competes as also in violation of the National Labor Relations Act. Um, specifically Section 7, which is the, the protection for concerted activity. So uh, that may mean, for example, that uh, your wages are stagnant or your wages are going down because of a merger or because of a, a, a divestiture from one company to, to another. And um, so now you as a group say, we don't like a practice or we don't like the wages that we're getting. We're all going to go up and resign. Um, and the the uh, employer, if they have a non-compete, of course, would use that against you, whether it was you're trying to start another business or you're trying to go to another employer of the same type in any way that goes in, in conflict with the non-compete that you signed. Um, and so the National Labor Relations Board then could step in, could enforce case by case basis um, against this uh, in, in, you know, claiming that you are you are in violation of Section 7 and 8 of the NLRA, protecting concerted activity in the workplace. Um, they do do that. However, the National Labor Relations Board is heavily underfunded. They had no uh, increases in their budget between 2014 and 2022. Last year, they finally got an increase in their budget, and it was about 7%. It was less than 7% of what they asked for. So uh, I don't know if you've ever gone to the National Labor Relations Board as a non-union worker, and they are supposed to be able to protect you. There are a lot of protections you're supposed to have but they have a massive backlog. They are attempting to get rid of the backlog, but in the last couple of years, because of these budgetary constraints, um, the NLRB has suggested that they're increase, that they have sh narrowed the increase each year in backlog. So the backlog continues to exist. It's something around 28% um, in 2022 and maybe a quarter uh, uh, you know, uh, in 2023 of an increase in the number of, of cases that they can't get to each year to year. Your other option, I would say, of course, um, is to organize into a union. There are uh, uh, many unions that you can organize into, but most unions 
do not allow non-compete agreements. They put it into the contract to prevent them. And in some cases, they actually do allow them, but they narrow them and they clarify them so that it does actually function in a way, or at least the, the workers and the management can come to an agreement ostensibly uh, in a non in how a non-compete can actually prevent you from taking your your you know their their patients or clients or customers um, or otherwise prevent uh, you from from poaching trade secrets or being poached by another employer. Which, there are two sides. No, go ahead. There's two sides though to each of these contracts. The employees have legitimate interests, of course. We want to be able to go get another job. We don't want to be stuck with our jerk of a boss for forever. And employees should have. You do have in this country an ability to move from job to job. Non-competes restrict that. Public policy has always been skeptical of non-competes, and it's harder to to uphold one than it is to get one thrown out. As a general rule, we've already talked about you know how much justice can you afford. It's hard to get to court. It's hard to afford to talk to TJ to get him <laughs> to tell you no, you can throw that out. That's no problem. And then it's hard to hire him to defend you when your former employer says, well, we're going to lose, but we're going to grind you into the ground and see if we can get you to drop out of the case first because we have money and you don't. All of these things are always true. However, there's also legitimate concerns that employers have. It, and I am certainly going to be advising my clients that we need to be looking at their, non, their non-disclosures, their non-solicitations. None of those fully capture what the employer's legitimate interests are. There are always abusive cases. Those should be subject to enforcement. Even I think that. Um, but <laughs> the the fact that abuses exist doesn't mean that there aren't legitimate concerns. If there aren't employers, we don't get jobs. So you want, and employers have trade secrets that you can't help but share with your employers or employees rather. Sometimes how the company does business is the reason this company does better than its competitors. I'm really, really sick of hearing the term secret sauce, which is the latest corporate buzzword, um, buzz phrase technically. But you know, we do it better than they do. That's why we have an edge in the market. If you've worked for me, you know how we do it. I can't take that knowledge back out of your brain. And I can't say when you go start your own business or go to one of my competitors, you can't take that knowledge with you because it's in your brain. You know how to do it. And I can't tell you, well, you can't use it. You know, I know these things. You can't keep me from doing it once it's in my brain. The genie, as they say, is out of the bottle, which is almost as annoying as secret sauce. <laughs> so, and when you're talking about non-solicitation agreements, they work to an extent. But I mean, I'm going to go back to the same example because it's what I've been doing most recently. As my husband said, yeah, this sucks. I'm out. Two of the admin staff and three of the nurses said, so where are you going? Mm -hmm. And he can't say, would you please come work for me? Nor would he. It's unethical. And he's actually going to a different enough job. There's no place for them. But five different members of his staff said, so where is it you're going? Do they have a hiring department? There's no, there's nothing in a non-solicitation that keeps the other employees from going and working for the same employer. He can't say, come with me, but if they just happen to show up. Now, I know he would not say, hey, I'm going over here, nudge, nudge. I can't ask you to join me, wink. You know, you know people do that. He wouldn't even have done that, but I guarantee if he were in a nearby practice, all of those women would have found the HR department and applied. Well, he didn't solicit them, but look, they just lost a bunch of employees. Similarly, with the, um, like I said, trade secrets are already talked about, but with respect to the employees, with respect to other gaps like that, if they show up even without him having said so. So that's, that's um, non-poaching, same thing for solicitation. I think, I mean, he, I think, 90% of his patients who he said, hey, your next um, follow-up is going to have to be with um, the other doc in my practice because I'm leaving as of next month. 90% of them specifically asked, where are you going? And even if they didn't ask that, hello, we have the internet. Mm -hmm. um, you can look his name up. You will find out where he is now. And so even if he doesn't violate his agreement at all, and he has a wife who's a lawyer, so he won't, um, I don't want to have to hire TJ. I like him, but I don't want to give him my money. So 
I can guarantee he wouldn't have violated any of his agreements, but I guarantee that his former employer would have lost both staff and patients, customers, without him doing it. So the employer who says, look, I can lose an employee if I don't want to lose my money. Well, you know, arguably the employer should have been nicer, but it's not always the case that the employer is bad and the employee is good. But when the if the employer discovers that every time they lose an employee, they lose a big chunk of business, there's no way to keep that from happening. They yeah. really don't want the competition to be across the street next week because that's going to start impacting businesses. And if one person or several people leaving impacts the business of the original employer, there's a lot of other employees, equally innocent and having a right to live and earn a living, that now have a bankrupting or a failing business that used to be just fine. So there are perfectly legitimate interests of an employer that should be protected or protectable at least, but aren't fully met by the things that the FTC suggests as do and set up. And one little point that I promise I'll shut up for a moment is mm -hmm. um, one thing the FTC rule did also, which seemed to me when I first read it to be an extraordinary overreach, was it's not just going forward, you can't ha sign these agreements. It was retroactive. All agreements that currently exist are invalid if their rule goes into effect. So I've already hired these people and I used a combination of these types of agreements to protect my business. Well, now you just knocked one of the legs out of my protection. Well, can I even make my existing employees sign a new agreement? There's a lot of argument that you can't. And so it's that it fails for a lack of consideration and other contract issues. So you were changing the deal for a lot of people and you had a lot of employers going, well, I also would never have shared these trade secrets with these employees, I would have been much stricter with who got to know stuff if I had known that they could walk across the street and work for my competitor next week. And so there was a lot of lack of fairness on that level from the FTC's overreach on that. Of course, if you're not protecting your trade secrets, I'm going to argue about that too. <laughs> right. If you're if you're over if you're oversharing your trade secrets, I'm going to argue it's no longer a trade secret too. But right. that's the uh, that, but so that's a different panel. One one thing on the the non solicitation though. Um, Courtney's absolutely right. It, it, it is a non solicit. You are agreeing not to solicit, whether it's employees or customers. It is nothing about your former employees or former customers soliciting you. But what I'm seeing a lot of contracts now that are trying to address that, they say that you will not solicit, nor work with, nor perform services for, nor, you know, nor do whatever is applicable for do your role. Do you think those are enforceable? Role. I think they are I drafted. Really I know they're drafted, so, but I well, don't. I'm, I've tended to think they're not, but I, I don't litigate. I don't. Well, so the default setting in litigation is you can contract whatever you want to contract to. So we would have to find some reason why it is unreasonable or or otherwise unenforceable. But is that a beyond the intent of a non solicitation rule that it's a, a governed by statute? Yeah, I think it definitely is beyond the extent of the Georgia statutes on non-solicitation agreements. But- And from a matter of public policy, what you're in effect saying is if one employer goes and works, you know, I've been working at Wellstar and now I'm gonna go work at Piedmont, no one else from Wellstar can ever go work at Piedmont. That's, but, Im that's impacting an awful lot of workers' ability to move jobs unfairly because one yep. guy got there first mm -hmm. and, and then vice versa. You have folks wanting to go from Piedmont to Wellstar, the first one can, the next 200 can't, and now you've got a whole lot of people trapped for nothing they ever even knew about, much less were part of. And one of the things, though, when I when I say it's drafted, the the issue is uh, there are a lot of these that that, like Courtney said, uh, we know they're unenforceable. I've yeah. I've had businesses come in and 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 have me draft agreements that would almost never fly. I've had. You it's know, clients bring me their 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 contract and say, "Yeah, this is probably almost never going to fly." But does your new employer care when they get the letter from your yeah. from your former employer? Does your does your do you care when your former company sues you and you have to threatens to or threatens or to does. you know and and you have they to have pay the money? They have in-house counsel. They can take you to court yeah. for free. So the the idea of a lot of these agreements is even if 
the likelihood is that a court won't agree with me. I still have a contract. I can argue I have an enforceable contract term. I can make a straight face argument to that extent. And you're going to have to prove me wrong. And that's going to be costly and time consuming. Yeah. And generally, most people won't do it. You read a contract. It says you can't do this. You don't do this. Yeah. I've had lots of clients come in and say, well, I know it won't be enforceable, but it's a great deterrent. Right. Because my employees are too stupid to know it's unenforceable. And I try not to work with those people. On, on that note, we have about six or seven minutes left. I wanted to throw it open for any questions because I kind of assume there might be some practical questions that some people we might would have. just keep talking. Right. Yeah. I was <laughs> right. Okay. Hey, uh, we'll be here till six. <laughs> Uh, I'm a sign language interpreter and almost all sign language interpreters are independent contractors and you haven't talked about independent contractors specifically so I'm curious we all have non-competes and they um I I yeah so anyway they're they're all over the country and so I was curious if they when you talk about employees are you also including independent contractors yeah, I think it can. I believe at least, so. Yeah. I haven't thought of that, but I think it, in this case, it would. Right. Well, again, for, for one thing, we, we are talking about generally what state statutes provide for non-competes and non-solicits. So the answer to your question is, what do your state statutes say, wherever you are? But the, I'm in Georgia. And then, so again, the, the statute provides exactly to whom that statute can be applied for a non-compete. But the, 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 bigger question is that you have a contract that says you will not do these things. And so even though the statute itself may not be applicable, and I believe it does apply to independent contractors, I would have to go look at it again to make, refresh I'm my recollection. The judge but, would refer to the regular employee right. rules if they were it, analyzing exactly. if you were in the same, if you were doing the same services as the employees. Well, actually that. most sign language interpreting agencies don't have staff interpreters. They have staff schedulers and they'll have 200 right. Sorry, contractors. What I, what I mean, right, but, when I yeah. say, are you doing, but the they're services? not doing any work like the staff is doing. Right. When I say that you're, you're, you're performing the same services as the employee under the statute, I mean, the ones the the sales or the customer fronting or the, you know, or the management or the executive level, those types, those things that are, that are defined in the statute as subject to a non-compete. If your employer can, even if it doesn't expressly say, independent contractor and i think it does um then you you would i would make the argument that you're an independent contractor not an employee but you're still performing these yeah. restrictive services and i should i should have the right to protect my business by applying these against you and usually when we talk about the employee context for non-compete we're using that not the way tax analysis would be right. to really make a distinction between an independent contractor and employee, mm -hmm. but to distinguish between the employee and the sale of business context. So I think the answer is yes, everything we've said would apply to you. And if TJ is kind of on the same page, great. Yeah. Thank you. That's there, most likely correct. There, there are also <laughs> there are also federal guidances on the question of what exactly an independent contractor is and the many, many employees across this country who are uh, wrongfully categorized as such. Right. Um, You're probably so, employed. <laughs> so you may yeah. also be able to be fighting on those grounds on a different on a different grounds. Okay. Um, I, I also, uh, you know, I know that we have almost no time. I haven't spoken a little bit. I want to be a bull in the in the China shop. I'll tell you, I as a worker, not a lawyer. Um, I <laughs> was told, I was told, uh, in this, in this, in this country that you can work until you can earn enough to either start your own business or excel in your field. And, uh, you are not told about non-compete agreements. Um, this is for me, uh, a question of the real ethics of, of the business is only can the business survive in the market? So if you have a competing business that shows up, then you just have to compete better. And if you're not good to your employees, then you just have to treat your employees better. That's the position that I would take, um, you know, with regard to can an employee poach their, poach your, your, uh, your current clients or your current patients? Can an employee start another deli across the street or another physician's office? You know what? Just compete better because this is capitalism, right? So, you know, we're not going to create extra protections for a company that can't treat its workers. So That's what I think. Pro but we labor do have... and pro capitalism. No, I'm, really I mean, I'm quite clearly, <laughs> I'm quite clearly an anti-capitalist. But sorry, sorry to interrupt. I want to get to the other two questions real quick. 
What is the most clever way somebody has actually gotten out of a non-compete, either uh, doctoring a uh, a form or doctoring a uh, a uh, a uh, an application uh, and then giving it back to said employer and then them having it for years and leaving and for some strange reason, oh crap, he didn't sign this. I, I mean, not legal advice, right? First off, yeah, I don't. <laughs> Doctoring I, implies it's wrong. If you strike through something and initial it, that's all you've agreed to. That's legitimate, right? I I have certainly seen no shortage of contracts come through my hands from employers who didn't get things fully executed, didn't get them initialed in the right place, didn't notice that there was a strike through or an edit. And, you know, to a certain extent, you should Sucks know what you're you. contracting. You, you, we're all, we're all held to read the contracts that we are entering into. Um, now in the circumstance where I sent you an executed contract and you, and I already had it signed and you struck through something and sent it back. Should I look at it? I absolutely should. Yep. But because I haven't agreed to the whole thing you sent me. Right. But is a but is a court going to agree with me that your that your edit may not be enforceable because it was it, it, it could go it could go either way. But certainly that all that means is now there's much more costly litigation. Yes, yeah, say that's going to go straight into your pocket. Yeah, it's not worth anybody's effort to take that in a lot of cases. So yeah, we've had we've had contracts where. Not through any dupl duplicitous intent, just human nature and mistakes happen. And uh, yeah. suddenly we don't have a signature on the thing that we really, really want to have a signature on. And it happens. And you should have checked. Yeah. Not not as infrequently as, as you so know. Them not checking before they said you're hired was their fault. Yes. Yep. Sweet. I got to wait. <laughs> Good for you. Nothing Thank that you. we have said is um, That's right. straight as legal advice. But yeah. yeah, when your when your employer hires me, I'm absolutely taking an alternative position. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get this one last question in, then uh, we'll have to call it time. Yeah, cool. Uh, I've had so many thoughts in the last uh, what 85 days since uh, I've heard this, but um, I'm a I'm a personal trainer, mm -hmm. so and I work for a corporate gym, uh, and they okay. have a non compete uh, that says that I can't train at other gyms, but um, I'm not going to say my name because there's nothing stopping me from training anybody outside of that. You know what I mean? Uh, privately or anything like that. So uh, I was just curious about what um, what that company would actually be able to do, like, you know, because the way I see it, it's just like a preemptive way that they could uh, set something up to retaliate against an employee. Um, you know, uh, they would call it enforcing the contract. They would call it enforcing. Yeah, but, exactly. You know, but if there was no, on which you know, side yeah, you're on. if there were no non competes, and then they found out, that, you know, this person was doing something privately, and then they fired you, that would be retaliatory. But because of the non compete and the law, it says that it's that way. And I'm very anti capitalist also. So, <laughs> and also uh, to 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 make another point, um, you know, if one employee being fired or leaving a company and the other and they're not soliciting the other employees from that company to join them but they join them anyway uh if you are pro-capitalist wouldn't that just be a failing company and right. your company failed you should have treated your agree. employees better honestly i tend yeah. to agree also yeah. but when the ftc is talking about how a non-solicitation agreement is just as good as a non-compete it's clearly not Right, right, right. And we don't want to enforce a non-solicitation agreement that is so broad that it would keep the other employees from leaving mm -hmm. because that limits them and they weren't the ones who got in the fight with the employer. They just said, hey, this is a better job. I want to go. Yeah. They're not subject to a non-compete or the job is outside the non-compete. But now if you if the companies have started trying to write these super broad non-solicitations because they can't write non-competes anymore, Instead of targeting their non-compete to defend what they need to defend, they're going to have an overly broad non-solicitation that's going to keep all the co-workers from being able to leave. And yeah. that's not right. That's way too anti-market. Okay. And, you know, I tend to represent employers, but that's appalling as a result to me. Okay. So I can... Nice. Thanks cool. so much yeah, for, your, for your questions and for everyone for attending. We really appreciate it. Please be sure to rate your panel on the DragonCon app. And... Unless you hated it, in which case you don't <laughs> So thank you again. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.